Hey everybody, welcome. Today we're gonna to be talking about what life is like for inmates that are on death row. The inmates that are waiting for the death sentence. They've been sentenced and their execution is set out. A lot of people don't understand how this actually works. And I thought it would be cool to give people a general idea of how all of this goes down. Now myself, I was never a death row inmate. I've been housed on the old death row at Oregon State Penitentiary. And how all that went down was Oregon State Penitentiary made a new death row. And so they were using the old death row as overflow for people that were in the hole. The hole is segregation, that's isolation. That's where they put you in the box per se. It's when you get a timeout. It's when you break the rules, you get caught, and they throw you in there for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, a 180. I think in Oregon, the longest they can give you in the hole is a 180. That's six months sitting in a cement cell with a toilet and a bed and a Bible all by your onesie, man. It's absolutely a lonely, miserable existence. But people on the row, they don't just spend six months in there. They're in there for literal decades waiting for their execution. So I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about what that life and that existence looks like. So, uh, let's go! So I'm going to be really honest with you guys, man. When I was out doing my crimes, when I was out stealing cars with never having gone to prison, everybody that I knew that went to prison for doing the crimes that I was doing, they had just gone to like little cupcake camps, man. Little minimum custody camps where they were out working in the community and it really wasn't that hard and like they had a decent run at doing their time. I never imagined that I would be sitting in a death row facility if I got caught stealing cars. Would it have deterred me? Probably not, man. Consequences don't matter to addicts very often. And I don't think that it would have swayed me either way. But I'm actually glad that I got the experience that I got because it was enough to make me really genuinely not want to go back to prison which also wasn't enough to sway me to not end up falling back into the same old patterns that I had been in. But like, man, it was a motivating factor, at least enough to get me to flee and be a fugitive from justice for long enough to get my stuff together. For those of you who don't know, I was an addict, which propelled me to being a career criminal for almost 20 years of my life, man. And I went to prison. I only went for 39 months. There's dudes on here who've done big boy time. I didn't have to do no big boy time, man. I didn't get caught for any of my major crimes, what I went to prison for was UUMV, unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. It's basically Oregon's version of Grand Theft Auto, but I racked up three of them before they actually sent me to prison for it. So they stacked it. You get 13 months each in Oregon for every car that you get caught stealing. So I stacked up like three of them. I went in for a little bit. I was expecting that I was going to go to some nice little camp, man. They shot me out to Snake River. I ended up landing because of my institutional behavior, because I joined a gang, because I was wild and out, they sent me to the only maximum security prison in the state of Oregon, and that's Oregon State Penitentiary. And that sort of sets the stage for how I ended up spending a little bit of time in a death row facility. And I think that a lot of people misrepresent what going to prison is actually like, and a lot of the stuff that actually goes down in prison on here, on social media. And I get it. I understand why they sensationalize it. They make it sound tougher and harder than it really is because it gets them views, man. They make themselves sound like they were some master masterminds because it helps them get clout, bro. We're not doing any of that here. I don't think going to prison is cool at all whatsoever. It's stupid. It doesn't make you gangster. It doesn't make you tough. It doesn't make you a man. All that it really means is that you got caught. Like you were sloppy at what you were doing. There's a lot of dudes who did a lot of big boy ass time, man. I'm blessed and thankful that I only did the small amount of time that I did because it could have been much worse. I've committed those big crimes. I just was lucky and blessed and graced not to get Get caught for that and only to get caught for some minor type of stuff. But yeah, so the way that I ended up doing time in a facility, like the part of the facility that had been used for death row for decades is I got in trouble, man. I was in there. I was wilding out. I was doing a bunch of gang stuff. I was getting a bunch of tattoos. I'd been in and out of the hole my entire time in prison. So like it, it wasn't unexpected. Like I knew what time it was. I was always wilding out. I was a troublemaker, bro. Like I went in there 
like a broken person and I continued to be broken and get more broken the entire time that I was in there. I should have used that time to really do a lot of self-evaluation, a lot of healing and propel myself to be in a better place when I got out. But unfortunately, I just wasn't there. I wasn't emotionally mature enough yet. I still thought that I was going to be some type of criminal that was going to make it some type of mastermind. I didn't accept that the substances had taken over my life and that they were currently at the wheel and I wasn't steering anymore. I kind of just went the wrong direction with it right from the gate man I immediately joined a gang so it's absolutely no surprise that I ended up in the hole and they happen to be using the old D row facility for hole overflow because Oregon State Penitentiary bro stuff pops off there constantly so they need every single available bed in the hole and they're letting people out early like quite often people will go into the hole and they'll give them like six months and they'll get out after four months and it really doesn't reinforce that the, the behavior that people are doing is wrong but like I'm telling you right now like isolation solitary confinement is a form of torture it's an absolute form of torture. And I get that when you're already in prison, like you have to do something big to get somebody's attention if they won't follow the rules and they continue to be harmful to the people around them. I 100% understand that because it's like, bro, they're already in prison. What are you gonna do to them? But I do think that we need to figure out something that's a little bit better than solitary confinement because people come out more volatile, more broken, more angry, and less stable after they go in. So first off, that unit was the most oppressive place I've ever felt in my life. There was a definite energy of like misery and chaos. And you could tell that there were still echoes and remnants of people who had spent decades in those cells waiting to die. It was thick. It was palpable. A lot of people ask me a lot of the time if I ever experienced any paranormal type stuff in prison, because it's a natural question, right? Like a lot of people die in prison. So it would be reasonable to assume you might see some ghosts, you might see some paranormal type stuff, and I never saw anything. I'm not gonna lie, like, it, it would make great views if I could say that I did, right? But, like, I felt it. I felt that energy. I felt that darkness, and I felt like there was, like, a spirit. There's an energy there, and, and it was undeniable. And, like, you could ask the COs that work those units, and they'll tell you the exact same thing. So, the cells in these units are not big at all whatsoever. They're one man cells. They're small because they have to keep these people isolated because they literally, when you're on death row, you have nothing left to lose. Like they are going to kill you. They're going to kill you. You already know that at some point, unless you get like clemency from the governor or something crazy like that, like you're going to die. You're going to go straight from that cell, you know, to the room where they take your life away from you. So if they put you in with a cellmate, there's very little motivation for you not to kill that dude if he starts to grate on your nerves and you're locked in there almost 24 7 for decades at a time so like people are gonna grate on each other's nerves i don't care if you love someone man like you can have a best friend and if you're locked in a little cement room with them for long enough you're gonna want to kill them bro it's just human nature so the cells in there are small everything is kept really dark you've got a bed You've got a toilet, you've got like one little metal chair that has like a little table about this big. It's big enough to write on and that's about it. You can also keep your food tray on there and you can use that as your table to eat. When you're in the hole, you're not allowed to have books in there. It's kind of a punishment thing. The only book that they can't deny you is like to have religious literature. So say if you want a Bible, you can get a Bible. If you want a Quran, you can get a Quran. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's it. You don't have anything else to keep your mind off of what color the walls are, counting the cracks in the ceiling. Um, you know, some of the times when you're in the hole, you'll like yell underneath the door and you'll use a little bar of soap to draw on the cement floor and you can play like uh, hangman. Some people play battleship in there. But like, really, there's nothing. There's nothing to pass the time. It's You're just floating in space and time. And it's really easy to start to lose your mind in there. I've seen a lot of dudes go crazy spending time in isolation. And that's just for punishment. That's just punitive. That's not spending decades in there. When you're in there for death row, though, you are allowed books. You're allowed commissary. You're allowed to get a little bit of extra food on the commissary and all of that. Like, they make concessions 
for people that are on death row that they don't make for people that are just doing time in solitary. Now, inmates on death row are allowed to get social visits. Like there's certain times that they can get visits a certain amount a week, but it's always through glass. There's like a protective plexiglass to make sure that they don't murk whoever's coming to visit them. And that's the only visits they get. They never get contact with another human being in any way, shape or form. Same thing when they're fed, man. The food is on a tray and it pushes into a little tray slot. It's a CO that pushes it through there, but they make sure that they can never get their hands on a CO because the motivation to kill a CO is definitely going to be there for somebody who's on the row and they have no reason not to because they're already sentenced to death. They have absolutely nothing to lose. So for the safety and security of the staff, they make sure that they never have any opportunity to actually get a hold of any of their staff members. If they need meds, the meds are brought around through Medline and they push them through the door, but it's not a situation where they can ever touch another human being for the rest of their life. Every single state is going to be different about whether or not they get like limited amounts of recreational time. Like I think that there's like federal guidelines as to how much recreational time they absolutely have to give them. But for the most part, it's generally just like a little tiny enclosed caged area. They're like an animal in a cage. And I think it's like an hour a day tops. Like most places I think only give it to them three times a week. Now, like I said, I've never been in there awaiting an execution, but I know just from personal experience, the hardest time that I ever did was while I was awaiting my sentencing because there was the uncertainty of not knowing what was going to happen or what the plan was for the rest of my life. Like if I was going to be in there for a really long time, if I was going to beat the case and go home and they leave inmates on death row with a certain sense of uncertainty up until 30 days before they're executed. You see, they do not tell death row inmates when their execution is actually set for until 30 days before that execution. And they can be in there like the average is 19 years. Now, some of them get executed a little bit quicker, but a lot of them, they've, they've gone 30 years. They've gone 40 years without actually getting their execution date set. And then all of a sudden, you know, you've waited in a little cement room for somebody to come and tell you that they're finally going to put the needle in you. And after 40 years, they're like, yeah, you have 30 days to live now, homie. And that puts your mental health through so much stress that people on death row's bodies actually deteriorate at a much higher rate, much quicker than people who are not going through that level of stress. It's like a whole syndrome that people have recognized that people on death row, their bodies start to fall apart within a matter of years, but they're stuck there for you know, an average of 19 years, if you're in there for the average amount of time, you're in there almost two decades. And after a couple of years, your organs start to stop performing the way that they used to. You start feeling weaker. Your muscle mass starts to shrink. Like regardless of how much you're working out, it's the stress that's eating you from the inside out. And then you have the isolation on top of that, which drives people absolutely insane. Like on everything, like I've spent enough time in the hole to know that isolation is one of the cruelest forms of punishment. And since we're getting into how inhumane I personally believe that this is, I think it's a great time for me to mention to you guys that I'm not anti-death penalty at all whatsoever. I think there's certain lines once you cross, there's certain things that you do to certain people, you don't deserve the opportunity to take another breath. I personally think we should install an express lane, man. I think you should get one appeal. One appeal, not four, five appeals. I don't think you should have to wait decades. I think that you should get one trial, one appeal. Didn't get it? Cool, we're taking you behind the courthouse, bro. We're just gonna end it, man. I don't think that it's right to put people on death row for decades. And I think that we shouldn't have to pay for their existence either. Like my tax dollars go to pay for dudes that we know did unspeakable things. They did them to women, they did them to children, they did them to the elderly, they did them to the disabled. Why do we have to pay for their meals? I don't wanna do it. Like, and I don't think that torture just for torture's sake is, is really a good idea either, man. Let's just get to the business, bro. Let's be humane about this. Let's take him behind the courthouse, put two in the back, and then call it a day, bro. You don't even gotta bury him. You know what I'm saying? Cremate them, spread the ashes wherever the hell. I don't care. That's one difference between me and a lot of the prison creators. A lot of the prison creators are gonna tell you, I don't believe in the death penalty. I don't believe it's humane. I think you give up your humanity when you commit certain actions, man. When you do sexual crimes against a child, when you do horrific things to women, 
when you do horrific things to anybody, bro, you're forfeiting your life, man. Like, and I 100% believe that and I stand by that. People get mad at me about it. I personally don't care, bro. And I know that a lot of people know about the last meal, your final meal, bro. They go give you one last banger before they put your ass to sleep, dog. And a lot of people are like, oh man, I'd order this and this and this and this. And they get really elaborate with it. Like, here's the thing is that the state is not gonna do that. The feds is not gonna do that. There's a $40 cap and it has to be something local. Like they're gonna give you a last meal, but like with inflation, bro, you could get yourself a couple happy meals and we're just gonna call it a night and we're gonna send you off straight out of your skin suit. And that's about it, bro. It's a $40 cap on the final meal, but you do have some choice. And when you're in prison, having choice about what you're eating is never on the menu, unless it's from the canteen and you have money and you can order it. Stuff that comes on those trays is consistent trash and you have zero control over it. They feed you what they want at whatever time they want. And it's never gonna be hot. It's always gonna be like lukewarm to cold. And it's just like not even real food at all whatsoever. It's warm ass trash at the absolute best. So getting a final meal, that is a luxury. So we do afford that to people. Let's talk about D-Day, man. What type of flight you got when you leave death row, man? So the most humane form of execution, according to the state, according to the feds, is lethal injection. That's like the most peaceful way to go. And that is the most commonly used form of execution. But they also still use in different states for varying different situations, the gas chamber, they use hanging, they can authorize a, a firing squad. There's many different forms of executions that can be done, but like 99% of the time, you're going to get that and they're gonna put you out that way, man, because it is the most humane way to put somebody out. Now you absolutely have the right to have like whatever religious type of person come and visit you before you're put to death that you choose because the state or the feds, they wanna give you the opportunity to get your eternal soul right with whatever deity you believe in before they put you under, man. So you do have that right and you have the right to ask that one is present at the actual execution. They're not gonna be like in the actual room, but there is like a witness section that people have to witness every execution. You have to have witnesses to make sure that you were ethically and morally and effectively put under. So you can request that one of those dudes is gonna be there. Like if you're Catholic and you want a priest, it's not my thing, but like you have that right, federally given right. What do they do with your body after you're executed? Well, that's actually up to the inmate's discretion, man. So you've served your death sentence, so your body is now free to go wherever you want it to go, as long as it's not alive. So like a lot of death row inmates donate their body to science so that people can try to progress scientifically and be able to cure diseases, do whatever type of testing they want that they need human cadavers for. And a lot also opt to give their human remains to their families to, you know, provide cremation, to provide burials, you know, whatever their wishes are, that's what happens with your body. You know what I'm saying? Like they give you that humanity after you're dead at least. And I think that that just about covers it. But if you guys have any questions, anything that I didn't include in this video that you want to know about, man, drop it in the comments. I appreciate y'all riding out with me again, man. I really do. Thank you for being a part of this community. I love each and every one of you guys, man. You guys are a part of my daily journey and my daily recovery. And I can't let you know how much that means to me. It's more than words. So until the next one, man, y'all be good or be good at it. And we gonna keep on keeping on, all right, baby? One love. Die! Oh, shit. Hold on. What the fuck?